Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the academic procession and the Chancellor. I declare that the 578th Convocation of McMaster University for the conferring of degrees is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning. I'm Dr. Doug Welch, Vice Provost and Dean of Graduate Studies. This morning I have the great pleasure of welcoming all of you, graduates and guests, to this convocation ceremony. I would like to start by recognizing and acknowledging that we meet today on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. Before we start our formal program, may I ask that everyone in the hall switch off their electronic device that may ring or beep during the ceremony. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge some of the notable leaders joining me on stage today. Dr. Suzanne Labarge, Chancellor, Dr. Patrick Dean, President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. David Farrar, Provost and Vice President Academic and today's Master of Ceremonies, Ms. Mary Williams, Vice President University Advancement, Dr. Maureen McDonald, Dean, Faculty of Science, 
assistant vice presidents, associate deans, chairs, directors, faculty members, and honored guests. I'd also like to highlight today the achievements of a number of our graduates. Stephanie Jones from biology received the Graduate Re Research Prize by the Canadian Council of University Biology Chairs for the best Chai Molina of Math and Statistics won the 2017 CAIMS, CSMAI, Cecil Graham Doctoral Dis Dissertation Award given by the Canadian Applied and Industrial Mathematics Society for outstanding PhD thesis in applied math. And Maryam Badva of Medi Biomedical Engineering who won the Mary Keyes Award for Outstanding Leadership and Service to McMaster. I would like to now call upon our Chancellor, Dr. Suzanne Labarge, to make her own welcoming remarks. Welcome, honored guests, staff, faculty, families, friends, and most importantly, graduates. This is an exciting day for all of you who are graduating today, as well as for all those people who have supported you and stood behind you, and in many cases, have had a key role in you being here today. You've achieved a great deal to get here, and you should all be very proud of your success and looking forward to what the future might bring. Congratulations, and enjoy the ceremony. I'm David Farrar, Provost and uh, Vice President Academic of the University. I have the great pleasure of being your Master of Ceremony this morning. I would now like to introduce Dr. Patrick Dean, President and Vice Chancellor, who will be presenting the honorary degree recipient. Chancellor Labarge. By the authority of the Senate of McMaster University, I have the honor to present Gregory Fulman. As the General Manager of National Research Council Canada Hertzberg Astronomy and Astrophysics, Gregory Fulman oversees what has been called Canada's Gateway to the Universe the organization that operates Canada's national observatories and national astronomy data center. Since assuming that role in 2003, Dr. Fulman has built on his well-earned reputation for leadership in both the Canadian and international astronomical communities. An expert in star clusters, galaxy clusters, white dwarfs, stellar populations and, and photometry, Dr. Fulman was educated at the University of Toronto and the University of British Columbia, joining the faculty of UBC after a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Cambridge. He has also been a visiting professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the University of Hawaii, as well as the Reinhardt Fellow at the Canadian Centre for Theoretical Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. Before joining NRC Hertzberg, Dr. Fulman also served as the Executive Director of the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope, located on Mauna Kea Mountain on Hawaii's Big Island. Dr. Fulman's leadership and vision have played a critical role in the development of the, of the National Research Council's long-range plan for astronomy in Canada in both its 2000 and 2010 iterations. These plans have guided Canada's entry into the Atacama Large Millimeter Array Project, the transition of the Twin Gemini telescopes from construction to operation, and Canada's participation in the design and development of the 30 meter telescope and square kilometer array organization. As a researcher, Dr. Fulman has influenced a broad range of astrophysics 
in the fields of observational galactic and extragalactic astronomy. He is a leader in the measurement and disentangling of major stellar components of galaxies using properties such as age, dynamics, and abundance of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. He has also undertaken important studies of the star clusters of the Milky Way, with a particular emphasis on exploring the remnants of the oldest stars, which are used to set an independent limit on the age of the universe. A member of the Order of British Columbia and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Dr. Folman has been extremely active within his field, serving, for example, as chairman of the Casca Committee for Image Processing, of the Canadian Time Allocation Committee, of the Joint Subcommittee for Space Astronomy, and of the Canada Foundation for Innovation Special Multidisciplinary Assessment Committee for Major Science Initiatives. He is currently a member of the boards of directors for the Gemini Observatory, the Square Kilometre Array Organization, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, and the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope. Madam Chancellor, every one of us has looked up into the night sky and wondered about the infinite mysteries of space. Very few people, however, have made fundamental and tangible contributions to our understanding of our universe. Gregory Fulman is one of those few. I present Dr. Fulman to you so that you may confer upon him the degree Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa. Gregory Fulman. By the authority of McMaster University Senate, I have the great pleasure to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Science Honoris Causa at McMaster University with all the rights and privileges pertaining to that degree. Congratulations. I will get to the here. And I would now like to invite Dr. Fallman to deliver the convocation address. Absolutely. Well, uh, Madam Chancellor, President Dean, honored guests, graduates, family and friends. It's a great honor to receive this degree from McMaster University, one of Canada's most esteemed universities and one, of, uh, one with which I've had quite a long association both through family and uh, through my science of astronomy and astrophysics. It's a real pleasure to be here. And so to the graduating class, I would like to say good morning and uh, point out that it's been 51 years since I was in your shoes as a newly minted Bachelor of Science degree after my name, 47 years since I received a doctorate in my field of study. To say that things have changed in that interval of time is an understatement with many exclamation points after it. There was no email, no internet, no browsers, no smartphones. The pace was immeasurably slower, and yet we were always busy. I think in 40 or 50 years, I can easily imagine one of you in this graduating class standing up at a podium like this and remarking, you know, when I graduated, people actually drove their own cars. <laughs> Amazing. You can't imagine the wasted time and traffic delays, and the carnage on the roads. It was appalling. On and on and on it goes. The world is changing. So I was originally going to develop that theme for this particular talk and uh, what it might mean to some of you. But my thoughts were deflected quite recently by a news report. 
Because uh, it, uh, this posed the question, are driverless cars conscious? So the context was quite simple. The car was out driving, passengers in it. It checks, its, it notices the fuel light comes on. Hungry, car is hungry. So it checks the GPS receiver, finds out exactly where it is on the surface of the earth, sends a query out to a search engine, and asks for a location of all the nearby filling stations. It then evaluates routes, other factors, maybe the brand, the service level, whatever, and then makes a decision and proceeds autonomously to its destination to feed up. That context struck me as fairly simple, and I think that given McMaster's expertise in the area of automotive engineering, I suspect there are many people in this room that could program a car to do most of what I just described. However, I think the implicit assumption behind that story is that driving a car is actually a very complex activity and depends upon synthesizing a multitude of sensory inputs. You assess them and then you act upon it after, an ana after some analysis of all the available information. It strikes me that that's a reasonably good description of consciousness, at least at the level of being aware of your environment. And it includes then also an assessment of the outcomes of what at the end is a quite a vast number of possible actions in response to some particular situation. That contextual example of a car just with the fuel light coming on is quite simple, but it's easy to imagine now much more complicated scenarios. For example, <clears throat> cars will be able to learn what their owners like and, suspect, and expect of them. So the car will be able to listen to the chatter of the passengers that it's faring about, and through that it will pick up all the cues that can guide its responses in any particular situation. So for example, on an extended journey, the, uh, the car discovers that its range is limited. Maybe there was an unexpected washout in the road and had to detour, and suddenly it realized it doesn't have enough juice to power the car to its destination. The car knows that if the adult, it's gonna take maybe 30, 40 minutes to charge up at some high throughput charging station. It does the scenario we talked about before, but then it's thinking about its passengers and it says, well, the adults are on board, maybe I should drop them off at the nearby Starbucks while I run off and, and juice up. But then it's thinking, oh, the kids are in the car. Maybe, maybe McDonald's is a better choice, you know? So the car's doing this kind of thing. So you get the drift of where I'm going here. At some point, the dimensions and possible trajectories through all this uh, reasoning multiply to the point where it's simple algorithms. If the light comes on, then I do this. You need a different approach to answer those kinds of questions. And we call that approach these days artificial intelligence. So the question I think is generalized, are advanced artificial intelligence systems conscious? And uh, I think that that's a pretty interesting question because it affects my field. We are in astronomy and astrophysics also experiencing the push of artificial intelligence in what we do. So <clears throat> I think that uh, description I went through is actually quite a good definition of consciousness. <laughs> so what I'm thinking of, what about self-awareness? Is an autonomous car aware that it is a car? And I'm thinking of these things because this graduating class and many others of this era 
standing on the shore of what I would call a vast sea, an uncharted sea, a sea that's going to be inhabited by all these new species of artificial intelligence. And that sea is, will wash over us, it will soak into the fabric of our societies in, in unimaginable ways, like the internet before it. And here's the rub. These AI systems will erase some significant fraction of the uh, jobs that many, perhaps even most of you in this room, will be aspiring to. Now, I don't mean that in a threatening way. I mean it in the way I described earlier. You're graduating now and you think you're going to be doing X and Y and it's all going to be down this road. It won't be. But uh, I think that it will change. In fact, many of you in this room are probably going to be involved in the creation of these systems one way or the other. But I dare say that uh, even the creators will not be immune from the impact of this artificial intelligence. So there's something qualitatively different about thinking about artificial intelligence that lends itself to dystopian views of the world. Why is that? You know, in a sense, it is misery is the stuff of drama, right? And uh, the plucky humans battling the evil machines is, is uh, good, fair for the big screen. But I think underneath all that, there is a sense that's been inculcated into us as human beings that we are distinguished from everything else, from all the other natural intelligences that exist in our world. We are distinguished from them by virtue of our superior intelligence. And in fact, the, the key thing there is self-awareness. But that thinking down that path, I kind of wonder uh, how much we really understand about human intelligence. And uh, is our sense of superiority, our sense of dominion, just a, a conceit? Now, I'm getting down a rabbit hole, and you can see that it is almost infinitely deep. So let me loop back. My imaginary artificially intelligent car was already exhibiting a couple of what I would call human intelligence traits, H-I. We exhibit H-I. So these traits would be things like empathy for the passengers in the car. They would be the ability to assess the consequences of the actions that we take. And that, too, is part of awareness. I think that as we go down that path, we then bump into ethical questions. And it is the realm of ethics that surely presents the terrifically hard nuts that the developers of these AI systems are going to have to crack as these systems become ubiquitous. So let me, let me turn and look at you again, but now with a different, uh, a different eye. Here you are, the new graduates, your newly programmed human intelligence systems. And uh, you have a very high degree of interaction with one another, which is another big theme in the world today, the internet of things. The, Difference is, I guess, humans typically interact at a rather low bit rate compared to what the machines can do. But nevertheless, we have other ways of communicating, and uh, that, that is something which I don't think we are fully aware of all the time. But as human intelligence systems, I would put it to you, how aware are you? How conscious are you? And I think that as members of a generation that will likely create and deploy many of these artificial intelligence systems, I would pose the question, will you have the awareness of the consequences of your decisions, 
of your uh, context that shape the decisions and shape the subsequent actions that you take. I think this is a real challenge ahead. I truly hope so. And uh, I think that it is institutions like this great university, McMaster, that give me and many others hope that this will happen. You, you as the graduating class, are in a very enviable position. There are amazing opportunities ahead of you, amazing uh, prospects to change the world, and I am actually not dystopian in my outlook. I am very optimistic. I would say utopian even in terms of what I think is possible. You will be in the vanguard, all of you. And uh, I wish you well. I wish you great success. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fallman, for those wonderful comments. I think you can see why it was that we were so honored to have Dr. Fallman accept an honorary degree from McMaster. Not only is he a superb researcher, but as you can see from his comments, he thinks outside of the box of his research. And I think that's what we hope for everybody. And he's just a wonderful example of it, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome him to the McMaster family. Thank you, Dr. Fallman. This next exchange is the really important part of our ceremony for our students. Dr. Patrick Dean will now come forward to present the graduates to the Chancellor for admission to their degrees. Will the graduates please stand? <clears throat> Madam Chancellor, on behalf of McMaster University Senate, I present to you these candidates and those in absentia in order that you may confer the appropriate degrees upon them. And I bear witness that they are worthy and suitable. Graduands, by my authority and that of the McMaster University Senate, I have the great pleasure to admit to those before me today and those in absentia to their individual degrees at McMaster University with all of the rights and privileges pertaining to those degrees. My sincere congratulations to you all. Please be seated. Graduates, I now ask each of you to join me on stage so that the Chancellor and I may welcome you to the McMaster Community of Scholars.
Ladies and gentlemen, so that each graduate's name may be heard, it would be appreciated if during the presentation of the graduates, you would hold off your collective applause to the end of each degree ceremony. Thank you. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Doctor of Philosophy. Siavash Amon. Edda Ibasi Ashu. Blessing Iko Basi Archibong. Nicole Lynn Battenberg. Chantel Elizabeth Corrine Markle. Shaya Selena Robinson. Arushika Vesathan. Vera Velasco. Anna Carroll. Ben Muirhead. Carla Brown. Ashraf Mohammed Ibrahim. Stephanie Ann Kedzior. Yang Lu. Darko Lubich. Emilia Perron. Vida Romani. Michael Sean Reed. Philip Tomanak. David Bowman. Sabrina Hodgson. Shui Ling. Amir Masood Mautasabi. Kelly Matolko. Wendy Wong. Sina Mol Molimi. Ahmad Siam. Bai Hao Yu. Kiret Dinsa. Shohido Islam. Jopia Jawad. Sean Edward Kovacs.
Shu Song Chen. Huai Ying Li. Nabi Nukura. Nukura. Niku Karan Dennis Simakov Yuan Ho Yu Matthew Bumston Zhao Wang. Jason O. Oh. Kirsten Elizabeth Bell. Carissa Canning. Allison Colleen McDonald. Joshua Nedervin. Hansho Lu. Steffi Yime Wu. Edson Pazur Bellidus Sosa. Mark Fraser. Keshuan Ju. Sandeep Beiru. Shuwanti John Alessandro Maria Savitella Yi Hong Wei Reza Gami Chuan Hu Jin Bayo Ning Mohammed Kamrul Islam Russell Jun Feng Yuan Ritesh Deya. Melissa Danielle McCraden. Manpreet Sembai. Sabrina Kaur Sien. Alexander James Cridland. Gwendolyn Marie Eady. Alana Mackenzie Hallas. Corey Stan Howard. Angus King Faymog. Timothy John Sagan Munsey. Evan Borman.
Nicole Labar. Luxley. Tyler Pallock. Alva Tang. Yi Yuan. Zhongshen Lu. Hamid Mohammed Goledeza. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Master of Arts. Larissa Mary Di Bartolo. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Master of Science. Rachel Atraj. Daniel Kushi She. Weezing Hua. Paul Peter Noops. Oops. Adamas Kuleza. Ramandeep Pavla. Himesi Samar Singhe. Shrenthiran Sritharan. Jonathan Tran. Courtney Young. Uruz Gill. Jennifer Wild, Vinod Prabhu, Mase Sayari Nezad, Samantha Catherine Feast, Christina Mary Genovese. Logan Chung Ritchie, Ryan Rolick, Alana Grace Mullars, Jacob Strong, Kaylee Cecilia Whelan. We Lu, Selby Elizabeth Sturrock, James Louis Cheng, Florence Elizabeth Gotkin, Stacy Priest. Nicole Sen. Jessica Scalteddy. Tedra Bolger. Bryden Eastman. 
Evan James Michel. Michael James Riddle. Corey Michael Richmond. Ruhi Sarma. Benjamin Richard Davis Purcell. Wyatt James Kirkby. Sarah McKenzie Piku. Jean Christophe Onodit Bhatt. Benjamin Kenneth Dale Pierce. Sean Kentaro Sullivan Takahashi. Rita Abdel Baki. Stefania Cherry Shano. Kyung, Kyung Wung Ruth Kim. Jessica Susan Miller. Erica Dow. Thomas Ulri, Urli. Shara Ali Altas. Angelina Pesaveski. Shara Catherine Rikuiti. Tyler Roik. Peter Alexander Tate. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Master of Applied Science. Mitchell William George Doty. Emily Ann Hicks. Alicia Annette Spadofora. Well, Hassan El Hassad. Ho Xing Lao. Hani Yosefi. Alexander Shashetti. Sarah. Ali Zeta. Ho Ding Li. Ying Shen Chao. David Schumacher. Daniel Tajik. Ki Chi Wei. Do Yang. Wei Zhou. Austin Michael Brown. Edward Matthew Glamfield. Jared Gauguin. David Andre Joel. 
Travis Seishkin. Simon Yunnan. Kaziz Mamuludan Hak Badhon. Evan Mark William Drew. Nelushi Christine Kariyuwashan. Kiyan Mao. Danielle Alejandro Orsorio. Christopher Leandros Pachartis. Marco Azarina. Robert Anson Lowe. Paul Richard Ricciuti. Eric Thompson. Min Shu. Mohammed Sahar. Shou Wei Zhang. Nathan Shane Cheddar. Where's the other reader? Vin Ray Yuvashankar. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Master of Engineering. Yu Yang Zhang. Hui Gui. Nathan Revel de Jong. Ji Wen Guo. Mohammed Zishan Ahmed Karim. Ilnaz Vadati. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Master of Engineering Design. Eniola Alese. Chinonso Abina Amadi. Michael Chikwuma Asuzo. Nathaniel Akoladi Ayan Lowo. <laughs> Yongshi Chen. Nadim El Dirani. Dashui Hong. Mina Hossein Zada. Jie Huang. Savish Girish Karandika. Paminda Kaur. Himanshu Dilip Kumar Lad. Pablo Daniel Lascano Montero. Sho Nan Liu. Lovadeep Singh Lotte. Dong Ye Lu. Christopher Lintz Macedo. Atif Mehmood. Varun Panchal.
Sanjina Pradhan. Meet Dramendra Dramakur Shastri. Manpreet Singh Sidhu. Iqbal Singh. Jaspreet Singh. Sandeep Singh. Tajinda Pal Singh. Yibu Sun. Simrat Singh Tandi. Yukun Wang. Tejiola Shimala. Feng Shou Yang. Rubing Zhao. An Zhu. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Master of Engineering in Public Policy. Christopher William Booth. Hatim El Sadiq El Mayin El Hag. Augusta Abinaju Erure. Kimberly Elizabeth Yusek. Jiyun Yang. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Master of Engineering in Manufacturing Engineering. Zuri Sadai Gomez Cruz. Patrick Meyer. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Science Honours. Hawa Abdul Noor. Muhammad Abidin. David Asiatuno Saisedu. Achana Ahilan. Luke Bayer. Mindy Erin Chapman. Rebecca Zayda Crawford. Jasmine Diol. Walid Ajar Dillon. Cindy Doan. Amanda Catherine Dorner. Connor Nicholas Egan. Ramtin Gassemi. Elizabeth Catherine Giles. Rachel Goodland. Maureen Goreal. Wanwei Kang. Sidra Romana Karim. Bakht Awa Khan. Wai Ying Lam. <laughs> Cheng Lu. Sherry Lu. Colin Brandon McDonald. Annie Nguyen. Isabella Nguyen. 
Fei Yu Peng. Natasha Porfirio. Prashant Rajaseka. Prasim Ranjit Singh Rajput. Manvia Singh. Disneya Thre Verin Thera Raja. Christine Yachu. Junyi Jang. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Science Kinesiology Honours. Nicole Amatruda. Eric Bertram. Alisa Carol Lacroix. Nicole Purdy. Joshua Van Der Veed. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Science Kinesiology. Brett Michael Dykstra. Kaylee Geyser. Sydney Ray Smith. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Science. Atika Ashrana Abdeen. <laughs> Nafis Adnam. <laughs> Miriam Armanius. <laughs> Salea Fatima Bacht. Aisha Khan. Jing Xuan Li. Lachman Perin Pathanan. Giancarlo Valente. Hayun Wang. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Engineering and Management. Mm. Kieran Arthur Hurst. Utman Shabazz Khan. Benjamin Taylor Metic. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Engineering and Society. Christian Florin Evascu. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the Bachelor of Engineering. Nicholas Michael Annabel. Matthew Artemenko. Christopher Kevin Campbell. Gurit Guriwal. Bilal Anjum Aztec. Anuj Jellingham. Akshay Ram Manta. Connor Gill Sheehan. Daniel Weber.
Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Applied Science. Danielle Christina Schwed. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the, ba the degree Bachelor of Technology. Adam Mervyn Anderson. Edison Balfour. Lawrence Tayen Chuk. Horia Herman. Meftu Ahmed Ibrahim. Andre Lori. Garima Kaul. Zoeb Syed Kaja Ajamal Hussain. Gavin Kisun. Frank Wekang Lin. James Marco Gelesi. Stefan Panarese. Venkatesa Prasanna Ravanuthala. Sorry, Amir Sheikh. Gurav Sharma. Justin Siemens. Gagandeep Sayan. <laughs> Papa Abdullahi Theum. Stanislav Tizar. Let's give one more round of applause to all the new graduates of the class of 2017. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to introduce Dr. Tarashika Vasantham, a PhD graduate in biology who will deliver the valedictory address. Good morning, Chancellor Labarge, President Dean, Provost Farrar, McMaster faculty, distinguished guests, family and friends. And most importantly, good morning to you, class of 2017 faculties of engineering and science. Having completed my bachelor's, my master's, and now my PhD in biology, I am both elated and honored to give the valedictorian address for the fall 2017 graduating class. Together, we have embraced the MAC bubble. You can always count on a MAC student to know the ins and outs of where one could find free coffee and free food. You got pizzas, I got pizzas, we all got free pizzas. Together, we have survived the perks and quirks of McMaster. Congratulations on surviving 8.30 lectures, Monday 8.30 lectures, organic chemistry, committee meetings, committee reports, a bunch of unsuccessful experiments that led to a single successful one, hopefully, coming to terms with not getting a p-value of less than 0.05. Yes, that was very, uh, quite significant. And if you have been here as long as I have, then congratulations on surviving WebCT, Elm, Solar, and now Mosaic. <laughs> All jokes aside, I consider ourselves beyond fortunate to be living in a country enrolled at an institution where education is perceived as a right, not a privilege. My parents, like many parents here today, immigrated to this country to provide my siblings and I something that they could not easily access, an uninterrupted education. 
A parent cannot secure a child's future if their present is in a state of uncertainty. Millions of children today are still denied basic education, the majority of which are females. Why? Because an oppressor knows that once an education is received, it can never be taken away. It is forever yours to keep. The co-recipient of the 2001 Nobel Peace Prize, Mr. Kofi Atta Annan, said, knowledge is power, information is liberating, education is a premise of progress in every society, in every family. Today, we not only celebrate the success of our achievements, but also the success of our parents' achievements. Today, we represent the progression in our society, the progression within our families. Speaking of families, let me tell you a little bit about mine. My mother is single-handedly the smartest, most courageous woman, correction, the smartest, most courageous person I know. She stood face to face with a soldier, begging not for her life, but that of a 13-year-old boy. That day, that 13-year-old boy lived because my mother chose to speak up. When my father was diagnosed with leukemia, my mother worked harder to put a roof over our heads and always fixed us a hot meal every single night. And when my father passed away, she continued to take care of us, playing the role of a father and a mother. In all the darkness that could have consumed her, her my mother's light never once flickered. She continues to illuminate wherever she goes. My mother, like all the mothers present today, is the epitome of persevering through adversity. I share parts of my mother's story here on this stage in the hopes that it inspires us, moves us, and encourages us to be valiant in the face of defeat. Remember, there is no such thing as can't, just won't. All it takes is will. We are all here today because of the will to learn, the will to challenge ourselves, and the will to finish what we started. As we step outside those doors, let us not lose that will. Now let me tell you about my father. He's probably watching down and thinking, please tell them how handsome I was, or how his hair was perfectly parted to the side. Well, forgive me, Dad. Like Terry the Dancing, Tim Horton's employee we all know and love at McMaster, ever since I could remember, my father was always the life of the party. When he arrived onto a dance floor, there was simply no competition. Now I'd like to be very clear, he was no Michael Jackson, by any means, but his spirit, oh, his spirit was undoubtedly infectious. Like the second floor of Commons at Mills Library on any given day, or like the HSR buses we have all squeezed into, my father's dancing always drew in a crowd. His laughter was in infectious, his optimism was uplifting, and his moves, slightly embarrassing. <laughs> University has been a lot like my father's dancing, a mixture of laughter, optimism, and slightly embarrassing life choices. But it's the culmination of these moments of sorrow and laughter, of vulnerability and invincibility, of failures and successes that has shaped us, impacted us, and sustained us to the version of ourselves that we see today, and we are better for it. So as we embark on the next phase of our lives, let us remember to dance like our fathers, liberated and free, let us remember to be courageous like our mothers, overcome defeat, and wherever you go, whatever you do, know that no student is quite like a student that graduates from McMaster. You, class of 2017, are already ahead of the game, so show them how it's done. Congratulations, we did it. Thank you, Tereshika. May I now introduce Don Bridgman, president of the McMaster Alumni Association, who will present the Distinguished Alumni Award for the Sciences category. The recipient of the 2017 McMaster University Distinguished Alumni Award is Brian Bloom. A graduate of McMaster's biochemistry program in 1998, Brian Bloom continued his academic career as a PhD candidate in the Department of uh, Physiology and Biophysics 
at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. Having completed the Canadian Securities course long before he'd entered his, uh, earned his McMaster degree, Mr. Bloom decided to combine his medical and financial expertise by pursuing a career that connected biotechnology and investment. He began working as an investment banking analyst and then an equity research associate in New York before returning to Canada in 2003 to join Dundee Securities Corporation. Over a half decade there, he played a key role in building his Dundee division into the most profitable healthcare banking team um, in the country. In 2008, Mr. Bloom co-founded and became chairman and CEO of Bloom, Burton and Co a firm specializing in healthcare-related investment banking. The company is now Canada's premier life sciences investment bank. One of the firm's signature contributions is the Bloom Burton Healthcare Investment Conference, which now attracts more than 1,000 participants annually. Mr. Bloom is also actively involved in guiding the process of several startup companies that he and his firm have supported. He is a co-founder and member of the board of directors of Ching Bio Therapeutics, based in Vancouver, as well as the co-founder and chairman of Toronto-based Grey Wolf Animal Health, Halifax-based Apelli Therapeutics, and Tri Triumvera, <laughs> and Triumvera um, Immuni Immunologics which is a McMaster University spin-out uh, corporation based in Hamilton. Mr. Bloom has dedicated himself to a number of sector and not-for-profit boards where his unique expertise makes his contribution particularly valuable. A past member of the advisory board of the Cell Therapy Institute at Princess Margaret Hospital and the University of Toronto, he also served on the advisory board for McMaster's Farncombe Family Digestive Health Research Institute and has been a strong advocate and champion for the development of the biomedical discovery and commercialization program at McMaster. Mr. Bloom is currently a member of the boards of directors for Biotech and the Baycrest Hospital Foundation, as well as the National Research Council of Canada's Life Sciences Advisory Board. McMaster is proud to recognize Mr. Brian Bloom of the class of 98 with the 2017 Distinguished Alumni Award. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Brian. I now want to introduce Tammy Wang, a 2005 Commerce graduate and a representative of the McMaster Alumni Association. Tammy will now deliver the Alumni Association address. Chancellor Labarge, President Dean, McMaster faculty, fellow alumni, honored guests, and especially the members of McMaster's class of 2017. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and congratulations. Not long ago, I was in the audience here at Convocation and instead of being on stage, I was where you are. And uh, there are a couple of things that you need to know. First off, the Chancellor's robes are awesome. <laughs> Second, Hamilton Place looks way bigger from here and to the members of the newest, to the newest members of our McMaster Alumni Association, I want to welcome you to the McMaster Alumni family. On behalf of more than 180,000 members who have come before you, it's a big and diverse group, and I know you're going to fit in just fine. Right now, you may feel like there's no big reason to stay connected to the Alumni Association, but there is. Especially in the first few years after graduation, the association can do a lot for you. Our MAC-10 program, for example, provides social activities, career assistance, online and in-person networking. 
We've even added a mentoring program that gives you access to the wisdom of hundreds of fellow McMaster graduates and, and a career services program that can include advice and support from our very own alumni career counselor. You'll learn about the MAC-10 and other alumni programs if you watch for emails from guys like Chris Picard and Scott who coordinate the program for us. Pick and choose the opportunities that mean the most to you and the association can do everything from connecting you to an alumni hangout in a new city to helping you get a great deal on insurance for your first car or apartment. There's way more information at mac10.ca and in the emails you'll be getting, so you don't need me to run through the whole list of them. You're all Mac grads, and I trust your research abilities completely. Instead, let me finish by encouraging you to stay connected. You'll receive Mac, the alumni news magazine, and Maroon, Maroon Mail, our e-newsletter. And you can also be a part of the association's communities on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, MySpace. Oh, OK, maybe not MySpace. Your relationship with McMaster should really continue beyond the moment you return your graduation gown. I hope it does. I hope that the university is a part of your growth and your progress, your story, and your life for a really long time. Really, you're just getting started. Today is a great day for all of you. I'm actually a little jealous. Congratulations, enjoy your accomplishment, and welcome to the McMaster Alumni Association family. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. I now invite Dr. Dean back to the podium to deliver his president's address. Madam Chancellor, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. About 18 months ago, from the same podium, I spoke to a graduating class such as yours about the nature of the relationship between education and society. That occasion was informed by the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, which had recently appeared. And I wanted graduates to understand that the dark history of residential schools in this country was profoundly relevant to all of them, not, not only as human beings for whom the suffering of others must always be relevant, but as the beneficiaries of a quality education and as the educators of the future. While education understood in the abstract as the cultivation of human potential must always be a good thing, one cannot say the same for the institutions through which societies seek to educate their members. One lesson of the residential schools is that when education becomes deliberate acculturation, it can be antithetical to the well-being of individuals and thwart their potential. Instead of building healthy communities characterized by diversity and respect for difference, such institutions compel homogeneity and encourage intolerance. They serve the political interests of the state rather than the good of society, if I can put it that way. That universities exist to serve society has been taken for granted in the Western Academy, at least since the 18th century when belief in the value of building great public universities took hold in Germany and then spread to North America. In the United States, the Morrill Acts of 1862 and 1890 established the so-called land-grant universities for the public good, providing instruction in what was called agriculture and the mechanic arts, which would bring immediate economic benefit to the community as well as education in the traditional liberal arts and sciences, which would empower the individual, and in the long term, redound to the benefit of society at large. The Canadian university system is overwhelmingly a public system. 
The country's top 15 research universities, amongst which McMaster ranks first for research intensity, are all public institutions, deriving significant operating revenues from the public purse and established under provincial legislation, or at least in two significant cases, a royal charter. 80% of all university research conducted in Canada occurs on campuses of the 15 research intensive universities. And the value of that is approximately eight and a half billion dollars a year. Those same 15 universities confer more than 75% of all PhD degrees awarded in this country. And they therefore provide the bulk of the country's sophisticated research and development labor pool. And they contribute more than $36 billion to the Canadian economy every year. These figures tell you two things about the system from which you are about to graduate. One is that a consensus exists in this country that higher education is vitally important for the national good and therefore worthy of public support at all levels. And the other is that those of us privileged to work and study in these institutions have an obligation to mobilize what we have learned and what we have discovered for the good of our communities. And just as we derive moral as well as material support from our city, our region, our province, our country, the benefits of our work should in some way accrue in each of those spheres as well. My hope today is that you will pause to think about the idea of community, about particular communities, such as the ones you come from, the ones you've been a part of during your time at McMaster, the one you join by becoming a McMaster alumnus, the others you will enter when you leave here, and also about how you can best take your lessons learned and skills developed in this community and turn them to the benefit of your new and future ones. I made a distinction earlier between community, society, and state. And I implied that although educators and public educational institutions have obligations to all three, their relations with the state as a political entity can be seriously problematic, indeed hazardous sometimes to the integrity of their mission. And that is where the doctrine of academic freedom intervenes. As Wilhelm von Humboldt, credited as the great architect of the modern research university, wrote in 1810, this is a quote from him, the state must understand that intellectual work will go infinitely better without it. Because, by and large, such an understanding does prevail in Canada, universities enjoy a comparatively high degree of autonomy and have been able to establish themselves as privileged communities that are both places of learning and an ongoing experiment in social formation. By that, I mean the following. By virtue of being self-governing, largely unencumbered by the challenges of non-academic communities, bound together by a clear and compelling mission, and afforded certain protections by society in order to do the work that society needs to be done, university communities have the potential to model a kind of social ideal. That is why institutions like McMaster commit themselves to progressive social values, to equity and inclusion, to democratic and collegial processes, to mutual respect linked to freedom of expression and to the freedom to protest. All commitments, which are on the one hand understood to be necessary for optimal learning and discovery, and on the other, the least, that is owed by the university to the community at large in acknowledgement of the privileged place which such institutions enjoy in the social and economic fabric of the country. From that laboratory, then, emerge graduates like yourselves and innovations and insights of all kinds that will help the world beyond the university become better and brighter. I noted earlier that McMaster was recently recognized as Canada's most research-intensive university, and many of you graduating this, this morning 
will have had a role in the groundbreaking research that is conducted in our institution every day. Your professors are world experts in a wide range of fields and are dedicating themselves to solving the world's greatest challenges, from antibiotic resistance and cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, autism and diabetes, to climate change, globalization, and the need for alternative energy sources. In the McMaster nuclear reactor, scientists are developing nuclear tools for medical diagnosis and treatment, providing the world's largest supply of radioisotopes for the treatment of prostate cancer, and are saying turbine engine blades for every passenger jet engine operating in North America. And now, thanks to a number of very generous gifts from our Chancellor, McMaster has also become a leading venue for the study and mitigation of a human challenge none of us can escape, aging. And that is appropriate, given that our university is also home to some of the world's largest health cohort studies, following communities in this country and around the world to examine patterns in health and wellness from conception to death. In all of these areas, and many others besides, the McMaster community is serving the national and global community beyond its walls. Social analysis and innovation born here is bringing benefit to communities elsewhere. Studies in culture and history are deepening the global understanding of what it is to be human. And creativity fostered on our campus ripples outwards, enriching life here and abroad. The work of McMaster, in short, is to advance the health and the well-being of human beings and communities in Canada and across the world. And that is a singular goal to which all our various disciplines contribute and in service of which they come together. In closing, though, I want to talk about all of you as the critical means by which the work of this university community is mobilized to help create a brighter world. As I've already noted, many of you have played important roles in the research enterprise here at McMaster, and in that sense, you've already made a considerable impact, especially perhaps if you've been involved in community-engaged research. Probably more of you have had the benefit of experiential learning opportunities in the Hamilton community, co-op, clinical placements, internships, service learning, and so on, through which, I hope, you have come to understand the extent to which your personal growth and prosperity has a symbiotic relationship with the evolving health and well-being of society at large. That is the main point which I wish to leave with you today. Despite my having noted several times that universities enjoy a privileged position to some extent apart from the communities in which they reside, it is a fact that whatever privileges they enjoy are conferred on them by society. Universities have autonomy because society believes it is important that they do so, not because it is their right in the abstract or because it has been ordained from on high, but because the complex ecosystem within which personal fulfillment and community progress are held together requires it. Take care to remember that you're part of that ecosystem. And that is something that is not necessarily easy to do on celebratory occasions like this, when we do celebrate the individual achievements of every one of you as individuals. But this is an occasion when standing out from the crowd is in a significant measure uh, the mark of success. There are more than 1.7 million students studying in Canada this year in 96 universities. If you consider that overall only 28% of adults in this country have a university education, graduates like yourselves are joining a minority segment of the population. Furthermore, you are graduating from an elite institution McMaster University is currently ranked 66th out of approximately 24,000 universities worldwide and stands thus in the top 1% globally. 
All of this means that you are today graduating with an enormous personal advantage. And compared with the majority of your peers in this country and across the globe, the odds of success are very much stacked in your favor. It is vital to remember, however, that while your success reflects very positively on your individual abilities and talents, your success is also a communal triumph. It has been made possible by the many communities of which you are a part, beginning with your families and friends, extending into your school as well as this university community, and outwards into the global community where, tragically, the success of some comes at a price that must be paid by others. It is only reasonable, then, to ask you, as you leave this place, to see your personal fortune as inseparable from and forever dedicated to the communal good. We are immensely proud of you. We have great faith in all of you, and in particular, in your ability to make this a brighter world. My best wishes go with you all. Thank you very much. Congratulations, the class of 2017. As a fellow alumni, I'm looking forward to see where you go from here. As Ms. Wang said, you're now a member of this larger alumna group, and you must admit that when you look at your valedictorian and our Distinguished Alumna Award winner, it's a good group to be part of, and so I encourage you to, to really participate. I just want to make a couple of comments about today in itself. Um, having graduated over 50 years ago now, the one thing I can tell you is you probably won't remember what anybody here said. In fact, I can assure you that by next year you won't remember who the chancellor was if you ever knew, and eventually you'll forget who the president was, etc. But what is interesting, and it's like your whole education here, is you may not remember the specifics, but you absorb from all of us something, and you build it into what you are. So I must admit is I may not remember that it was Dr. Fallman who said it, but I will every time I see an autonomous car say, does it know it's a car? <laughs> right. And is that that makes up the knowledge base? And it's back to the comments that President Dean made. As a member of a community, here you have been fortunate enough to mix with a wide range of people in areas that are not just yours, to be able to ask the kind of questions, to think the kind of questions that Dr. Fallman raised today. When you leave here, you're again part of a larger society, but you're also going to be subsumed by the fact you're now trying to establish yourself in a job. You're setting up a family. And it's so easy with our current world to stay in a bubble that says, these are the people I know, these are the people I talk to, and you're in the echo chamber. You have a great opportunity, whether it's through the Alumni Association, through your colleagues, to reach out to remember you are part of a larger community and to try and understand what's going on there as you create your own life. It's a great opportunity, and I think all of you are going to enjoy it. And I also want to come back is today really is, although we do it as a group, a celebration of your individual accomplishments. But there isn't, and I know, any one of you here who won't say, but I couldn't have done it without my parents. You're right. You couldn't have done it without your friends. Absolutely. What would you have done without the support of the faculty? Difficult to think. But eventually, you had to make the decisions as to what you wanted to do, what you wanted to be, how hard you wanted to work, so that you could stand here today to get your degree. And that is something you will find you will get very, there's very little personal recognition as you go forward into a larger society. This is one time when we are celebrating your personal accomplishments. So I want to congratulate each and every one of you and wish you the very best as you go forward.
Now I'm going to just do my normal little wrap up here, which is to say, would you please remain standing at your seats until the academic procession and the graduates have left the hall? And finally, please join now in the singing of the national anthem. After the singing of the anthem, this convocation stands adjourned. Thank you.